Now for the last section in this mini-series we want to look at the pulmonary veins. What will cause an increase in pressure in the pulmonary veins? Well the blood is draining from the lungs, from the pulmonary circulation, back through these pulmonary veins. Four pulmonary veins actually enter the left atrium. The blood from the left atrium goes through to the left ventricle and then out to the aorta. So I think you can probably see that if the left atrioventricular valve, the mitral valve was not working properly, then when the blood, when the left ventricle contracted, the blood could be ejected the wrong way. I mean, some will go that way, but some will go back as well, and that would increase the pressure in the veins. So failure of the mitral valve would lead to pulmonary venous hypertension. As would failure of the aortic valve. After ventricular systole, the aortic valve would normally close to prevent regurgitation of blood from the aorta back into the left ventricle. So failure of each of those valves would be a, a problem. As would failure of the left ventricular myocardium. So here we have the left ventricular myocardium. Thick myocardial tissue. And this can fail, causing left ventricular failure. Failure of the left ventricle. And as with many conditions, as we've seen, it can be acute or it can be chronic. There can be an acute or chronic form. Now the acute form can be caused by valvular failure, but the most cases I've seen of acute left ventricular failure have actually been caused by um, acute failure of the left ventricular myocardium, normally caused by an infarction. So if there was an infarction to an area of the myocardium, that area would no longer be contractile unless you rescue it, of course. And that can result in reduced left ventricular contractility. Now, the we've got the normal pressure there supposed to be about 12 to 14 millimeters of mercury. If the pressure, the back pressure rises due to left ventricular failure or valvular failure in the pulmonary vessels, if the pressure rises to about 20 millimetres of mercury, you'll start to get interstitial edema. But if the pressure rises to about 25 millimetres of mercury, then pulmonary edema will start to develop. So if we think about the lungs here, we've got the alveoli. So the small bronchial passages go into the alveoli. And if the pressure increases, fluid will start to accumulate first in the interstitial spaces, interstitial pulmonary edema. But then the edema will start to accumulate within the alveoli themselves. And I think you can clearly see that if there's fluid in the alveoli, the oxygen cannot get to the respiratory surfaces. And in the same way, the carbon dioxide is not going to be, go, be able to get out because the whole area is waterlogged. So there can be an acute pulmonary edema. Now, one of the first features we get in this is uh, orthopnea. Ortho actually means straight. Pnea means to do with air or breathing. Now what happens here is, if someone's, um, imagine someone's lying down here, this is, this, is the, uh, this is the chest when someone's lying down. That's the head here. Now if they're lying down, here's the lung fields. And if they're lying down, the fluid seems to go all over the lung fields.
making it difficult to breathe. They can't get the oxygen in, they can't get the carbon dioxide out. So shortness of breath when lying down. But then when we sit them up to a sitting up position, what seems to happen is the fluid drops to the lower part of the lungs. And you might know from x-rays you get these characteristic so-called small curly B lines in the periphery of the lung field. We can see these fluid levels. But what this means is that this top part is actually left free. of fluid. So gaseous exchange can take place more freely. So the assumption is that the amount of fluid in the lungs is the same, but here it's all in one place when the patient's sitting up. So we can manage the patient leaning forward in the so-called orthopnic position. And when it's severe, when pulmonary edema is severe, there's a, a great increase in pressure. As you probably know that round about the um, round about the alveoli, there's an extensive network of pulmonary capillaries. And these are going to drain out into, of course these arrive from pulmonary, uh, they arrive from a pulmonary arteriole. So the blood's going to go into a pulmonary arteriole, leave via a venule. But if the pressure here is greatly increased, because there's back pressure here now, because of the left acute left ventricular failure, because of that back pressure, the pressure is greatly increased in here. We're going to get the pulmonary edema, but if the pressure is very increased, that can actually burst some of these blood vessels and the red cells will leak out. So we'll end up with red cells in the alveoli because of the severely increased hydrostatic pressure in the pulmonary capillaries. And this blood's going to go in mixed with the mucus, it'll eventually go up and it will be coughed up as pink frothy sputum. So pink frothy sputum in combination with orthopnea. Now if you see the pink frothy, frothy sputum that, that, that's a severe clinical feature we need to, it's a bit of an emergency. You can get it in high altitude um, pulmonary edema as well. High altitude pulmonary edema, so-called HAPE. And we use the American E for edema. The other one, of course, is high altitude cerebral edema, HACE. Um, so the pink frothy sputum. So the orthopnea of the pink frothy sputum. Features of the severe pulmonary edema. Now the chronic form of um, left ventricular failure can be caused by hypertension. In hypertension, the blood pressure here is high, so there's an obligatory high output from the left ventricle, eventually causing ventricular hypertrophy, cardiomegaly and failure. But also we've said ischemic heart disease and disease of the valves. Also anemia. Anemia is a surprisingly common problem. Do be aware of the risk of anemia in your population. Anemia affects something like 20% of the world's population. And what that means is that the left ventricle has to work harder over a long period of time to get the blood circulating, to get the oxygen round to the tissues of the body. It's another obligatory high output condition. So these patients are going to be tired with left ventricular failure, short of breath on exertion, dyspnea on exertion, orthopnea. Very often when they're lying down at night, they get what we call um, nocturnal dyspnea. Because when they're lying down at night, as we've seen, the fluid can go all over the lung fields. If you listen to the chest, there'll be, uh, there'll be crackles, crepitations. To try and compensate, initially the patient has a, high, a fast heart rate and the heart will, as we've said, increase in size because of the hypertrophy. So, the pulmonary edema is caused by the left ventricular failure because the blood can't drain back in. Pulmonary edema. Now, over time, the left ventricular failure will also lead to right ventricular failure. So we get a combined 
cardiac failure. But this diagram explains perfectly why the right ventricular failure is going to damp back, causing the systemic edema, why the left ventricular failure is going to damp back, causing pulmonary edema, whether that be acute or chronic. So a very simple diagram, but it actually explains quite a lot of um, cardiovascular disease. Well worth memorising this or a simple or similar diagram like this so you can use it in your own in your own teaching.